Welcome to Patients at Risk, a discussion of the dangers that patients face when physicians are replaced with non-physician practitioners. I'm your host, Dr. Rebecca Bernard, and I'm also the co-author of the book, Patients at Risk, The Rise of the Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant in Healthcare. And, you know, many of our podcasts have focused on concerns about the deterioration of nurse practitioner training. You know, where there's really been an increase in these for-profit schools, and they compete fiercely for student tuition dollars. Some of these programs boast 100% acceptance rates. In other words, anyone who applies gets accepted. Students who attend programs like these often complain about subpar education, including open book tests, and the graduates really end up being really unprepared to take care of patients. The rise of these diploma mills has led many to call for reforms to the nurse practitioner educational process. What many people do not realize is that the medical profession itself also faced serious reforms in our educational processes following the release of the Flexner Report, which outlined problems in the training of physicians way back in 1910. So today I am joined by Dr. John Lafferty to discuss the Flexner Report and the importance of standardizing education for all medical professionals. Dr. Lafferty is an obstetrician gynecologist and he has a special interest in the history of medical education. Dr. Lafferty, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. John, why don't we start out by having you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in this topic. Sure. Well, I've worn many hats in my professional career. Um, I was in private practice. I have also been an employed physician. I am currently working at a health department as my career is winding down. I have been on the faculty of a clinical faculty of a medical school, and I have been a preceptor for a physician assistant program for a couple of years. Um, I think of more interest in terms of this current topic is that I think I was the first obstetrician in my area to hire nurse midwives. So I have worked with non-physician practitioners. Um, My father, I think, was the first pediatrician in the area to hire physician's assistants way back when they were all going to brick and mortar programs. And uh, we've had a very good relationship with them. And I want to emphasize that. I have a distinct memory, and I went to med school a long, long time ago, that the first thing that was told us on the first day was, we are lucky to have you. You are lucky to be here. And we all nodded our heads knowing how tough it is to get into med school. And he said, and you're going to med school at a marvelous time in history, thanks to the Flexner Report. And he briefly discussed it suggested that we go and read it. Five minutes later, we had plunged into anatomy and physiology, and I doubt that anyone delved into this 300-page report. As my career was winding down and as I started to see some issues that concerned me, I went back and read it, and I think that's going to be the thrust of this podcast today. What, What do we want? from any clinical practitioner, be it physician or someone else, when we seek medical care. And I think that we certainly want our practitioner to be nice. We want them to know about our family. We want them to be kind and loving. But I think as I asked my non-medical son the same question two days ago, and he's just, he can be pretty blunt. He was in the military. He said, I want them to fix the problem. I want them to find out what the problem is and fix it. The practice of medicine, before we get into Flexner, is very hard. I would venture to say that of all occupational groups, we as physicians have the longest formal training of probably any occupation in the United States. And there's a reason for that, is that the core duty of a physician is to diagnose and treat disease. The core training of a physician is basically in making a diagnosis. And I hope I've got some heads nodding among all of our physician colleagues in that that was basically what it was. Yes, you had to learn the basics. You had to learn the anatomy and physiology. But all of our clinical training was directed at a group of people coming in with a group of symptoms, 
and being drilled day after day, month after month. What could this be? What could this not be? What is most likely? What is less likely? And I'm going to throw out for the public and for us physicians that that takes an awful long time to learn. And I don't think it can be done in a year or two any more than you can take a bright and talented piano student and turn them into a concert pianist at Carnegie Hall in a year or two, or a basketball player and turn them into an NBA star. I just think it, it, takes, it takes time. Well, no, it really does. And actually in our book, Naran and I talk about the 10,000 hour rule, which is a fairly standard idea that it takes about 10,000 hours to gain expertise in any subject. And it's not just 10,000 hours of, you know, just reading, or I mean, it's 10,000 hours of dedicated, dedicated effort and practice. So, and I, I, exactly what you said, I remember when I was uh, interviewing for my residency program in family medicine in our Uh, director sat down with me and he said, the thing that separates a physician out from any other type of clinician is that you must be a diagnostician. And that is really what all that training is about. We can't follow algorithms. We, our job is to figure out what is wrong with a person, what is going on with them? Because if you don't have the correct diagnosis, you can't fix anything. You don't have the correct treatment if you don't have the correct diagnosis and you will not solve the problem. It all starts there. I think that physicians in this country, despite the pandemic and all the political stuff, are still held in quite high esteem. And I don't think they're held in high esteem because they think we're nice people or well-educated or maybe have more money than some people. I think we're held in high esteem because we're very good at what we do. And again, why are we good at what we do? Let me turn the tables on Rebecca Bernard and be the interviewer and ask her one question. When you were finished, Rebecca, with your fourth year of medical school, do you feel that the very next week you could go out and hang a shingle and independently and safely and competently diagnose and treat basically anything that came through the door? In absolutely no way was I anywhere prepared to care for patients independently. And perhaps even at the end of my three rigorous years of residency, when I started my first real job, it was like another residency because I spent so much time then researching, looking things up and continuously learning. So the answer uh, is absolutely not. I was not ready. And I have never met a physician that answered that question any other way. So what I did in response to reading your book about three times uh, was to conservatively add up some 35, 40 years ago when I was in medical school, my clinical hours. And that's where I have a problem with what's going on in this country with nurse practitioners and PAs. I added up conservatively. This does not count the first two years of med school when you're in the lab and studying. It does not count any home study. It only counts the clinical, actual face-to-face hours. And I cannot imagine that my experience was terribly different than anyone else's that is a physician. And I added up that my total medical school clinical hours in the third and fourth year was 4,500. I had an additional because in OBGYN, we do go four years. So that that does vary from specialty to specialty. Um, Another almost 13,000 hours. Now, we know that the clinical face-to-face hours that a lot of nurse practitioners have is something on the order, as you said, of 500 to 700 hours. And I think the public and the physicians need to reflect on that number. It's turning now to the fact that we think that we are competent because, not because we're better or because we're smarter, it is because of those hours of training that every day we were, we knew that the attending was gonna ask us a lot of tough questions and we had to be ready. And we talked about how high positions are held in esteem, but it might surprise the public, it may surprise some doctors, and this is why I advise everyone to read the Flexner Report, At the turn of the century, the educated physicians or the educated public viewed most physicians 
not all, but most, as charlatans, hucksters, and quacks, and for good reason. We can look at medical education as going through three distinct phases in the United States. Briefly, in colonial times, we're talking about the times of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, that era. If you wanted to be a physician in general, if you were very wealthy and very rare, you went to the universities in Europe. But most physicians did what amounted to an apprenticeship. They linked themselves to another physician that was to the extent that that physician was excellent, it was excellent clinical training. There wasn't a lot of didactic training. And at some point, there were no regulations. You just hung up a shingle. Shortly after the Civil War, the second phase started. The second phase was what was called the rise of the proprietary medical school. Now, what this was, was one or two physicians would start a medical school. There were no regulations. Anybody could do this. They would generally have a series of lectures in the morning and a series of lectures in the afternoon. It would go for about a year or two. There were generally few, if any, exams. And at the end of the time, if that one or two doctor faculty, so to speak, deemed that that person was qualified, they handed them an MD degree and medical boards were basically powerless to say no. Um, and they went out and practiced medicine. Um, the, Carnegie, the public started to get worried about this and appealed to the Carnegie Foundation to comprehensively study a bunch of things, but the, the number one report that came out was on medical education. This was led by a man named Abraham Flexner. And we need to know just a little bit about Flexner and try to deflect some criticisms of him, uh, of which there are some honest criticisms. He was a Hopkins graduate, the newly built excellent university in Baltimore. He graduated from that school and he was not a physician. He was an educator. He developed some educational systems. He did spend some time in Europe. So he got to do two very important things, Rebecca. He got to see what medical education was like in Europe, which was far better than in the United States. And he got to see what he came to probably accurately describe as the one medical school in the country that was doing it right, which was Johns Hopkins. He basically did something that is really extraordinary, thinking about no airplanes, trains, that was basically the way he traveled. Over two years, he went to all 155 medical schools in the United States. Now, I want you to think about that number. There were more medical schools in the United States in 1900 than there were when I applied to med school in the mid 70s and almost as many as today. Yeah, I think and, there's 179 today, right, last I right. checked. Exactly, something on the 175, something in that order. Um, now, um, he basically divided them up and once he got finished into three groups, and this will really surprise you. There were about 20 of these schools that he deemed being good. Hopkins was one of them. Uh, there were several others. They basically required some college work and very quickly required a baccalaureate degree. They were tied to a university. That's the second thing. They had a faculty that was dedicated to doing nothing but this, a teaching faculty. And they had a teaching hospital on the campus. They required science courses, meaning physics, math, chemistry, biology, before you could get in. That was 20 of the 155 schools. About 50 of them, if you had a high school diploma, you were in. And the other 80 or so, you didn't even have to have a high school diploma. And remember what the curriculum was, one or two years of lectures and no hands-on. And he was someone who said the hands-on clinical is what makes a good physician. Let me, let me go ahead and say two things about Flexner because at the 100th anniversary of this report, there was some pushback of the way we think about things today 
that probably is true, but should not. They, as a result of this, they wanted to wipe this thing off the table. Flexner was a white man. He probably was racist. He was probably sexist. However, he did, in terms of sexism, he did. He said some things in his report that I think were remarkably progressive. He said, well, I think women have a place in medicine. I think that they don't need to be trained separately as there were separate women's medical schools, all of which were closed as a result of his report, but they were all closed, not because they were women's medical schools, but because they were substandard, okay? Um, and I think that if we are going to do this, they need to have the same opportunities as men. And it's right there. And it's, um, I think it's on page 173. So you can go and read it. But some of the things are just chilling in the deja vu part of this. Page 10, as a rule, Americans, when they avail themselves of the services of physicians, make only the slightest inquiry as to what the previous training and preparation has been. It is clear that as long as a man, again, a man, it's, it's pejorative, is to practice medicine, the public is equally concerned in the right preparation for that profession. The schools that have been ready to assume the responsibility of turning loose upon a helpless community men licensed to the practice of medicine without any previous thought as to whether they have received fair training or not. And what I hear with that is this exactly what you said is happening today, this assumption that, well, if a person is licensed, then surely they must know what they're doing. Someone must be supervising this or ensuring that it's being done properly. And it wasn't then. And in some cases, it is cases it isn't now. Well, as a result of the Flexner report, as I mentioned, there was outrage. And basically the state, the legislatures in Congress empowered state medical boards to say, set high standards based upon Flexner. So if you went to a medical school, entered a medical school that didn't have the kinds of Hopkins criteria, we're not gonna give you a license. And so as a result, by 1930, the 155 medical schools have been reduced to 66. Mentioning the um, traditional African-American medical schools, and I do want to say this, yes, there were seven and it was reduced to two. And he did have some racist things to say about African-American physicians, which would, were just clearly untrue, but he did want to keep the two schools that he thought did pass muster and they, they stayed, they happened to be Howard and Meharry. Um, so what happened as a result of this was what we would expect. The quality of physicians went way up, but the number of physicians as we went into the war, the World War II declined and the demand for medical care grew exponentially after World War II and the, as the other component of medical schools, which was research and the development of drugs and the development of therapies that really worked for the first time, when you went to a physician, you probably had a pretty good chance of actually being helped rather than hurt. And so demand for medical services just increased to the point where we get to 1965 and the start of two programs as one solution, one solution was to increase the number of doctors in med school, and they started to do this. Um, but they had high standards. And so at Duke University, as you know, they started the PA program. At, the, at Colorado, they started the pediatrician, started the nurse practitioner program. Now, let us say that at the beginning, these programs were brick and mortar, they were not online, as there was no online. They were generally nurses that had had at least five years experience. They were probably the best of the best. And the same for the PAs. They were, they were veteran medics that had been in Vietnam, among other folks. Um, and of course, within 15 years, 
um, these two new professions began to ask for increasing practice autonomy and the programs proliferated. Uh, there are now over 400 nurse practitioner programs and 250 PA programs. Um, and my angst started among many things um, as I, you know, began to become a preceptor at a PA program and sort of began to see that they were predictably having great difficulty finding clinical rotations of any quality for these students. These students that I precepted were uniformly bright, motivated, but they were not getting the education that they were paying for. And I don't see them having a lot of control over the kinds of educational experiences they're getting. But I can tell you what it was like in the PA program that I was a preceptor. They were having so much trouble that they, I was willing to do it because I love to teach. But I was at that point not doing any obstetrics and I wasn't doing any major surgery. And they said, no problem, we'll make it work. And so my PA students basically were in a low environment practice of looking at folks that needed birth control and, and folks that were women that were pregnant. And they had cut the rotation, which they clearly advertised 200 hours of clinical experience in women's health and 200 hours of surgery and 200 hours of psychiatry and of the other clinical rotations. But my, obviously my role was in women's health. The last year, and I think this is important for the public to know, and this is just the truth. They were in my office for a total of not 200 hours, but about 30. And of those 30, since we had some patients that didn't want them to participate, their actual face-to-face -face with patients for their entire women's health was under 15 hours. And the other, what did they do with the rest of their time? Well, the school had online lectures and things of this nature. That sounds an awful lot like the proprietary medical school of the 19th century. Well, what I'm hearing is a couple of things. First of all, the apprentice model that was not good enough for physicians is what the training standard is in many cases for NPs and PAs. They get assigned to someone, either they are lucky enough to have a school help them find a preceptor or they find them themselves. And then that preceptor is basically the extent of their education and their experience. So for example, and I've precepted, of course, many NPs and PAs in the past. Now I only take physicians, medical students or residents, but you know, I'm a family doctor and I work in Southwest Florida. So what that means is I take care of a lot of senior citizens and I love it and it's great. But if you are hoping to get a full spectrum family medicine experience, you're not going to see a lot of babies or small children in my practice. And so the, the challenge is that these apprentices basically are only getting trained on what their preceptor sees. And in many cases, that's just not going to be enough. And I think you are actually sharing with me, I mean, a very core skill that PAs and nurse practitioners and physicians, of course, need if they're doing primary care is the ability to do basic preventative women's services like pap tests. And I believe you told me that they only got to do just a few paps when they worked with you. I had PA students, not from their lack of wanting to do it. It was, it, it wasn't their fault, right? Um, but they probably got one or two and, and that's, you know, that's certainly, and I, I have taught, I talked to the directors and I was a preceptor and wanted to do a good job. And I said, what problems do you have? Say, we have this problem across the board and so does all the other programs across the country. It's also was true I had, and again, this is secondhand, but I, being so interested in this, I quizzed my students, my PA students, and they said, in one instance, their pediatric rotation, they could not find a rotation for them. And so they put them in with a family practitioner who did, as you say, very little pediatrics and they basically saw three or four children. The yeah, entire, it's not enough. And that, and that counted as their rotation. 
Yeah. And now that's why we're seeing these posts from new graduates saying, Hey, can you give me some advice? Because I can't seem to figure out how to find a cervix or where do I learn how to dose medications for children? And these are people that have already graduated and basically they're trying to learn on the fly and that's just not going to cut it. You know, one of the things that you mentioned that Flexner recommended was that, that there be a teaching hospital. And when I think back to my medical school days and my preceptorships, one of the ways that we gained so much experience was that we worked at these large tertiary centers that had a large catchment of patients that were coming from all around the state to this center. And it was a, a wonderful opportunity as a student and as a resident, you just had so much exposure to patients and to pathology. And when you're out in the community, you may not just have that same volume or those same, that same degree of pathology. Well, and, you know, to the lay public, uh, and maybe to some physicians, the one of the big differences in medical training and training of non-physician practitioners is that they do not have a residency, and we have both previously said that, and, and I 100% agree with you, I learned how to practice medicine in my residency, not in medical school. My, and, and, and even in med school, we had far more contact with patients than a lot of these folks have. And I, I hate to say it, but I don't think that you could run into a single physician that had been, has been practicing for a long time that hasn't run across instances where not only have PAs and MPs that have seen people in an urgent care center or an ER made mistakes, but they've made mistakes that no physician would have made. Now, not all of them, you had a spectacular case in your book where someone died. And we have to say that we're not saying that that is happening a huge amount of time every day but less than that, people are not getting properly diagnosed. And it has nothing to do with the motivation of these folks. It has to do with the fact that they're being put out there in situations where they're under trained, in my opinion. Yeah, in my opinion, the NPs and the PAs are actually just as much of a victim as anyone in this because their institutions, their leadership is telling them that they can go out and practice. And in some cases, they're being put by corporations or academic centers, even into positions that they really are not prepared for. And they're just, you know, if they don't know any better, they're just winging it. And that is really dangerous. How about Rebecca, page 15 of the Flexner Report? A heavy sympathy for the American youth who too often to the prey of commercial advertising methods is steered into the practice of medicine with an almost no opportunity to learn the difference between an efficient medical school and a hopelessly inadequate one. Wow. I mean, that's exactly what we're seeing now. So what I'm hearing from you and what I'm seeing here is it's time for a Flexner report for these professions. How does something like that come about? What do we need to do? I think that your organization that I have joined um, may have to do some, some heavy thinking about this because it, it is political. Um, you are swimming against some currents that are very, very difficult. I know that no, I don't know at this point where I can enumerate all of them, but certainly there is a push because of COVID to say, well, let's just let them all practice. Uh, there is a push because of general lack of physicians and, and of which we know, but we also feel that some of that has been generated by Congress and not having enough residency physicians, um, not being as efficient and getting those folks through. Um, but we're going to have to look at all this, but I do know one thing, I don't think the solution to the problem is to substitute well-trained folks for lesser trained folks. And when I say training, again, I, if I get phone calls from the nurse practitioners that don't agree with me, I am not talking about your sense of worth or your ability to potentially do things. I would hope, and I have talked to some of the older 
nurse practitioners and physician's assistants that did train in the 60s. And Rebecca, they also quietly are appalled at what's going on, but they will not speak up uh, in some cases. Well, a lot of times they're being told not to by their leadership. And you may recall that back in the end of 2019, the American Association of Nurse Practitioners had their annual conference. And in their final lecture, which was given by Margaret Fitzgerald, a nurse practitioner educator, she put up a slide and it had a smiley face with a zipper for the mouth. And it said, sometimes the strongest voice is silent. And her message was, if you do not agree with full practice authority, if you do not, if you have concerns about nurse practitioner education, you need to stay quiet. You take this to, to keep it on the inside. Don't air our dirty laundry. We don't need to talk about these things. And nurse practitioners are aware that if they voice anything, they are, you know, they're potentially getting themselves in a lot of trouble. I have no doubt that there are nurse practitioners and physician's assistants that every day confidently and accurately take care of folks. My, my issue is that because of their training, if there's something unusual, they are more likely to miss it or not diagnose it properly. Um, and it has everything to do with the training. So let me say in terms of reform, um, sure. I think that your attorney, if you, uh, the, I think this would be a radical proposal that would get pushed back against quite a bit, but I think that in the states where nurse practitioners are practicing independently, I think we have to redefine that as essentially the practice of medicine, and I think they should come under the medical board. If they are working under the license of a physician, then probably not, uh, and I think that that would be one thing. I certainly think we have to point the fingers also at physicians in the supervised states, this one being one, I have seen examples where um, they are supposed to be supervised and I have seen practices out there where the non-physician practitioners are not being supervised at all. Uh, there's no charts being reviewed. There's no phone calls happening. And I think that we need to look at that and at least be honest about what we're doing or not doing. I um, could not agree more. In fact, one of the things that I'm concerned about is I'm seeing these online, do you need a physician collaborator websites where basically, you know, doctors are signing up just to basically get a check to quote, you know, supervise or collaborate, but are they really doing that? Or are they just basically taking advantage of this broken system? And I think that we definitely need to hold our own accountable. If you are going to collaborate, and I like to say supervise, then you need to take that seriously for, for patients. I mean, that's a huge responsibility. Well, I have talked to someone on the North Carolina Medical Board who does agree that a, a nurse practitioner who is, has a practice in Western North Carolina whose supervising physician is on the coast, the Atlantic coast, 300 miles away, does not constitute supervision in his view. And so I'm hoping that at least in North Carolina, we will start to look at that. If we're going to have, be a supervised state, we, need, we really need, we need to, in everything we do, we need to be honest. And there's a lot of dishonesty in what the programs are offering. There's obviously, not the subject of this podcast, but there's a lot of dishonesty in how non-physician practitioners present themselves in a clinic setting. You have had other podcasts about that. Um, and I think that the public deserves that much. And that's what we're all about. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really all about patient safety. And that's what our organization, Physicians for Patient Protection, is really about simply ensuring that patients have access to physician-led care and truth and transparency. We just believe that patients should know who is taking care of them, what are their credentials. We do not oppose nurse practitioners or physician assistants at all. In fact, we think they're really important members of the clinical team, but they really should be practicing under supervision of a physician 
if they want to practice independently, that would be something I would encourage, but that would require going to medical school and doing a residency. And we've interviewed many doctors on this program who have done exactly that. They were PAs or they were NPs and they decided they wanted more. They wanted to know more. They wanted to put in the time and they did it. And that is a path and it's an option. And that group of people, which I think are very valuable to a person looking back on their nurse practitioner education or their PA education and their physician education were astounded at the depth and, and length of what physicians have to do vis-a-vis -vis these other groups. We hear it every so, time and they always say, I had no idea what I didn't know. And uh, I guess it's that whole Dunning-Kruger effect where, you know, as the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. It's really quite uh, frightening, actually. And I think it's one of the reasons why uh, a lot of doctors, when you talk to them, no matter how many years they've been practicing, they will still tell you, and I will too, that we're all, we're a little scared every single day because we realize that there are always going to be some gaps in our knowledge and there's always more that we can learn and need to know. And uh, it's, it's a great responsibility to be in this position. And the, the, the good nurse practitioners and PAs that are out there do know their limitations. Um, but if you don't and you're in a situation where you haven't been properly trained, that's when it gets dangerous. Um, ran across a quote and I'm going to finish up by quoting people, but um, the great physicist that had Lou Gehrig's disease, um, Hawking uh, from Britain, he said, the enemy of knowledge is not ignorance. The enemy of knowledge is the illusion of knowledge. <laughs> and so I would also like to quote for those of us that love history and hopefully got something out of this foray back into Flexner and to realize the phenomenal parallels between what was going on in medical education, what they in the medical profession did to correct it, how it elevated the profession, it would be such a great thing for nurse practitioners and PAs if they also had a flexion report and streamline their education and in some cases went back to the way that they originally were trained to start with. The famous quote of George Santayana, the philosopher said, those of us who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And I'm afraid in some cases we are doing that. The great novelist in Mississippi said, the past is not dead. It's not even past. And then my favorite philosopher of all time, the catcher for the <laughs> New York Yankees said, it's deja vu all over again. Well, thank you so much. I really want to thank Dr. John Lafferty for joining me for such an interesting discussion. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, I encourage you to get our book. It's called Patients at Risk, The Rise of the Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant in Healthcare. It's available at amazon.com and at Barnes and Noble. And if you're a physician and you'd like to learn more about getting involved in promoting physician-led care, I would encourage you to join our group. It's called Physicians for Patient Protection. Oh, thank you for showing the book, John. <laughs> Uh, join our group Physicians for Patient Protection. Our website is physiciansforpatientprotection.org. Thank you so much. And we'll see you on the next podcast.